I welcome you to the 2022 Franciscan Zoom Lectures hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology. Our presenter tonight, Father Garrett Galvin, OFM, was born in Wilmington, Delaware, to parents who emigrated from Ireland. Garrett entered the postulancy program of the Franciscan Friars of St. Barbara Province in 1992. He was ordained in 2000 and worked in parishes in San Francisco and Oceanside for three years, primarily in the Latino ministry before returning to studies. After receiving his doctorate from Catholic University of America, he began teaching full-time at Franciscan School of Theology and the Graduate Theological Union in 2009, where he taught a variety of courses on the Old and New Testament, as well as Hebrew. In 2011, he published a book entitled Egypt as a Place of Refuge. He is also the author of David's Successors, Kingship in the Old Testament, published in 2016. He now serves as president of Franciscan School of Theology at the University of San Diego. I welcome Father Garrett. Thanks so much, Joe. It's um, great to be back here and doing another Zoom lecture. And we started this almost um, two and a half years ago, and we've been able to have um, lots of good lectures over the years. And um, I think I did the first one, and I think this might be my third or fourth one, but um, I'm really delighted to be here with all of you. So this evening, what I really want to focus on is the beginning of the Bible, the first chapter of Genesis, and thinking about the Franciscan tradition. And I you know, believe strongly that this really is one of the most important chapters of the Bible for us Franciscans. Not the most important. I think I did a lecture a few years ago on, on 1 Peter chapter 2 as the most important chapter. But certainly, chapter 1 of Genesis offers us a lot to think about and I think really reinforces a lot of things that are innate within the Franciscan movement and will be well worth spending some time thinking about this evening. So. Um, as we think about this, then, we'll, what I like to kind of think about of, of Genesis 1 is that you know, it provides that spiritual formation for God's people. So I really view Genesis 1 as a formation book. And formation is kind of a funny word. We use that quite a bit in religious life. Um, and so we could kind of think of it you know, in, in other ways as kind of a training manual. Um, but the idea really is that as we are formed, um, as we develop and grow, um, we need to have places to kind of check in with and that will kind of help us. And I think we do this in lots of ways in our lives. Um, so if we consider our spiritual lives, Genesis 1, offers us a lot there. And so um, I think the invitation for Genesis 1 is to really see all of creation working together and to see this as both good and harmonious. Now, it's important to state this because we don't always see harmony when we're in the Bible. And not everything is labeled as good. And so as we think about why we have Genesis 1, I'd invite you to just think about like how a book is written. If any of you have written a book and in your experience is anything like mine, what you discover is you write most of the book before you write the introduction because you have to kind of think it through. You have to do some research. And if you do good research, you're not going to be 100% sure of what the answers are until you've done that research. And then you come back 
at the very end and write the introduction because you know what you've written about and you're trying to put it into some context. So that's very much how I view Genesis 1. And I would say most biblical scholars today and view it this way as well, that if we look at Genesis 2 through 11, we find an older set of stories, an older group of um, stories that Israel has. And if we look at Genesis 2 through 11, we see that most of those stories are sin-centered. You know, so when we talk about Adam and Eve, you know, the snake doesn't come too far after. There's some problems there. When we talk about Cain and Abel, fortunately, we end up talking about a killing. You know, when we talk about Noah's Ark, we have this great flood that causes so much mayhem. And then when we talk about the Tower of Babel, you know, we see that that is not the right direction to go in, and that this this the tower, it's actually the city and Tower of Babel are actually kind of remnants of pride and caused by pride. So we've got a lot of negativity there. And I think the final editor came along and just put in Genesis 1 to kind of emphasize what we're going to see in many other parts of the Bible. And that is just how much God loves us, just how much um, God cares for us, and how we have to be able to have a sense of that when we are dealing with sin. So we don't deny sin, but it's not the center for us. So we have Genesis 1 then as an introduction to God's good and harmonious creation. Another thing that we'll think about, and we'll return to this you know, at the end of this talk, is just how orderly Genesis 1 is. Um, and so we see this kind of goodness and orderliness as something that God intends, that God desires. Um, and we'll think about why that is. And ultimately, you know, not to not to keep any secrets, but we can see that the writer of Genesis 1 has a great concern with you know, structure and wanting us to have structure for our lives. And so we'll see the seven days of the week as kind of providing that structure. And ultimately, I think we're invited to replicate that, to, you know, to bring order to difficult situations. And this is what we see happening in Genesis 1. And this is what we see so many of our heroes of the Bible doing. We can think of Abraham and Sarah. We can think of Rebecca and Isaac. We can think of many others that bring order to chaotic situations. And so when we think about that order, we can also think about liturgy. And so if we're Catholics, oftentimes we'll think about the mass and we'll know that there's a structure to that. And no matter where we are in the world, no matter what language is being spoken, we kind of have a sense of what's going on by the actions of people. You know, when we hear the gospel, we kind of have a sense of what's been before that, what comes after that. And so we have that same type of precision here in Genesis 1. And we'll see how things keep on kind of coming forth throughout the book of Genesis to offer that to us. So that's very important. Now, one of the things that we learn from studying the Bible is when something is repeated, it's important. And so um, we'll hear, if we think of the Acts of the Apostles, for example, we'll hear about Peter having experience of the goodness of the Gentiles twice in chapters 10 and 11 of Acts. Then we'll hear about Paul's conversion experience three times in Acts, chapters 9, 22, and 26. So we know those are two really important events, and those are the two most important apostles in the Acts of the Apostles. If we look at the first chapter of Genesis, we see this line, God saw how good it was six times just in this chapter. So I think that is going to be really significant for us. And 
something that I think has to kind of echo in our heads, echo throughout our lives. And because we know that there are difficulties, we know that bad things happen to us. And so the Bible is going to start off by really an avalanche of goodness and a constant affirmation you know, that God saw how good it was. And so this is in many ways in contrast to the societies around Israel. So we think of chapter one as a creation story, and we also think of chapter two as a creation story, two different creation stories in the Bible. So often we find in the Bible, not either or, but both and. And so we see a creation story of Adam and Eve in chapter two that has some negativity to it. Um, you know, God makes lots of things before Adam kind of finds a partner. Um, things aren't always um, done in a kind of a logical and structured way. And then when we look at a lot of the stories and the societies around Israel, we'll see the same thing. Oftentimes what we see is that humans were made simply to kind of do the things that the various gods weren't interested in doing. So this is a, a big contrast to what we find in the first chapter of Genesis. And this is important because at the time Genesis was written, you know, scholars will speculate about this, but I think a good guess would be around the year 550 and BC. You know, at that time, Israel was really struggling. The leadership of Jerusalem had all been kidnapped and forced to move to Babylon, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away in current day Iraq. And probably most of the skilled um, laborers and the people that could read, and only a small percentage of people could read at this time, were also taken there to do um, work because those skills were needed in Babylon. So when Israel's writing this story, it's going through a very tough time. And yet we see this important focus on goodness, that just because one's going through tough times doesn't mean that God isn't present, doesn't mean that God can't be found in those tough times. And so that's, you know, an essential part of this story. And, um, and as we kind of think about this, you know, recently I've been reading an article by our last presenter, um, Father Mike Blastic, and um, the article is entitled Contemplation and Compassion, a Franciscan Ministerial Spirituality. And one of the things that he really focuses on in this article is that we have the ability to see and recognize love hidden in suffering. So Israel was confronting a lot of suffering while it was in Babylon, and yet it could keep on talking about all this goodness. And by emphasizing goodness, we then have the ability to recognize love and suffering. So that ends up being a really important role. Um, and so we see this emphasis on love, and I would say basically a rejection of the kind of sin center that we see in some other stories in the Bible, and certainly a rejection of the negativity that we find in a lot of other creation stories um, where you know, humans were simply created to do things that the gods didn't want to do. So, so this line, I think, is just so important for us to remember. God saw how good it was. And so there's lots of different ways that we can kind of focus on that. Um, but we'll come back to God seeing. And of course, we'll think about goodness. Now, it's an important thing to kind of have a sense of the world from the perspective of the biblical writer. So many people have interpreted the book of Genesis over the years that at times we can get a little bit of distance from it. And so we're always encouraged to really sit with the language itself and try to hear it 
with kind of new ears rather than to maybe focus on it as other interpreters have focused on it. So here we have, you know, the first line. And I'll say it quickly in Hebrew, Bereshit, bara Elohim, Eth HaShemayim, Be'eth HaAretz. And we oftentimes translate it in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I had the good fortune to teach Hebrew for a number of years. And if you translated it that way, I might actually mark you down a little bit. Generally, when we have this type of expression, we would say, when God began to create the heavens and the earth. Um, so this sense of in the beginning can actually give us a false sense. And there is a different sense of God starting something. Um, so that's just something for us to kind of think a little bit about, but it also kind of gives us a sense that, um, that there was something that God came to. And, um, and so it's hard for us to kind of figure all that out, but there's different philosophical notions of you know, God kind of creating out of nothing. But when we read this passage carefully, that's not necessarily what it's implying. Um, so we'll think a little bit more about that, but you know, just something for us to kind of have a sense of. And we see that, I think, in a little bit stronger sense in the second verse. So we'll move right on from chapter or verse one to verse two. The earth was formless wasteland and darkness covered the abyss while a mighty wind swept over the waters. And so, so this is kind of what God is coming to. We don't necessarily sense that God actually created this. And so, so when we kind of read this line, you know, what we really focus on is chaos. And we've got these kind of four words, formless, wasteland, darkness, abyss. So we don't have a sense of God kind of creating an abyss. Um, and what we, I think, have a sense of is God kind of moving from chaos to order. So really trying to, you know, help us in that. And I think that's so important because if your day is anything like mine, you know, you're confronting chaos quite a bit. And we're called to kind of confront that chaos, um, I think, by the Bible in a clear way, you know, that we want to bring some structure bring some order and, and to find goodness there. And so, um, so that's, I think, important for us. And, you know, especially as Franciscans, you know, I think we're called to really be able to kind of contemplate where we are. You know, we're gonna come back to seeing quite a bit. And that kind of initial kind of challenge that I said is that we have to kind of nurture the ability to see and recognize God's love hidden in this world. And so, so when we come to chaos, you know, there's a challenge there. Where do we find God's love? And because all of this is transformed and this is where we see, you know, God meeting chaos and being able to transform it. God will change these things, but God won't change every aspect of it. And I think this is, you know, an important lesson that we have. And so we see God bringing order and goodness to this chaotic world. And we're called, I think, to contempt, contemplate, you know, all these things, but called to contemplate where we're going to find goodness and see how God will transform a situation. And this is the story, really, of the rest of the book of Genesis. So we'll have that famous light, famous line in, in Latin, you know, we say fiat lux, let there be light, and there was light. And so with that, we have a sense of, you know, God doing something to help us, that if all we have is darkness, it is going to be a great challenge for us. Darkness has its place, but it can't consume us. And so we see 
in this verse and then in the verse to follow, you know, that God, you know, creates light in order to help us. And, um, and at the same time, there's a role for darkness, you know, so, you know, nowadays, I think we hear an awful lot about the importance of sleep. Certainly, whenever I watch a ball game or something, sometimes it seems like every other ad is for mattresses and things like that. So we know, you know, that this is very important and we need darkness in order to sleep. So there's still a role for that. And at the same time, in order to see, we need light. And it's clear that we have to be able to see God's goodness and that this at times is a challenge. And but God is bringing goodness into the world. And we, you know, that's repeated six times, you know, in this chapter. God saw how good it was. So we have that um, challenge, I think. And, and the challenge is, I think, to think a little bit about what does light allow us to do? And so, um, so within that, you know, that can be a little bit complicated. Um, and as Franciscans, you know, that's even, I think, more of a challenge because, you know, while as Franciscans we do things, there's also this sense that we need to be able to use that light to receive things, to be able to see the pain that people have, and to be able to sit with people in their pain, to be able to kind of help us just be with people, you know, that people need someone to talk to, see, people need someone to share with, people need someone who sees their pain. And, you know, if we get too busy, we can kind of overlook all those things. Um, as we kind of see in that story of the Good Samaritan, you know, the Levite and the priest are rushing, I think, back to the temple in Jerusalem, and they don't see that man suffering. Um, so we have that challenge to use God's light, to be people of compassion, to see what's going on in the world, and to be with people. So from day one, then, we'll move to day two. And so now we're going to start seeing um, some structure, you know, that God is creating dry land, God is creating vegetation. Um, but we'll also see that this will kind of push us away a little bit from some of the challenges that people had in the ancient world, especially in the ancient Near East. And so one of the things that we'll talk about a good bit is how Genesis 1 really, you know, attempts to stay away from the mythology and stay away from the gods that were ever present in the ancient world. And I think it's kind of giving us a little bit of a lesson. And, and I think the best way to think about Genesis 1 is as a parable. And I think with any parable, you know, we miss the point if we try to um, understand it in terms of knowledge. So if I think about that parable of the Good Samaritan again, and I start trying to figure out, well, where exactly did this happen? You know, like where, what's the most dangerous part of, of Israel? And, um, and, you know, what was the Samar Good Samaritan's name? And, and I get into all those kinds of details. Well, maybe I'll be able to figure some of that out, but what I'm getting is knowledge. And I think what Genesis 1 wants to point us towards is wisdom. You know, what do we really get out of this? So we're not to treat this as a scientific text. And a lot of times, you know, the more scientific terms, which we find in other parts of the Bible, are not used here because it's really trying to impart wisdom to us. And so one example of that is here in verse 10. And I take an, it's kind of an old um, translation, but I think it'll make the point. And God calleth to the, the dry land earth and to the collection of the waters, it called seas. And God seeth that it is good. And the point here is that Genesis avoids using the term Sea, which is the Hebrew Yam, and because that's a, the name of a god, and 
it then uses the plural that wouldn't be associated with the God. Once again, trying to move us away, I think, from knowledge and towards wisdom to kind of understand the story, to understand what's going on here. And this will continue um, on day four. We'll find kind of a similar thing of demythologizing, of pointing us in the direction of, of wisdom rather than knowledge. Because what we'll hear about are two luminaries that are created, you know, the great one of the day and the smaller luminary of the night. Well, it could say the sun was created, which is Shemesh, but that's the name of a god. And it could say Yarea was created, and that too is the name of a god. And so I think the writers of the Bible at this time who would have been living in um, Babylon, in Iraq, where they would have had a language very similar to Hebrew called Aramaic, these words would be in there and they would be very aware of, you know, the great temples to both of these gods that would be in the ancient Near East and perhaps how significant these gods were in those cultures. So rather than using those names of the gods, once again, they just kind of refer to objects. And so, so again, I think we're called, and we see the challenge, I think, in our contemporary world, um, where a lot of times the Bible, and especially the first chapter of Genesis, is used like a scientific textbook to give us knowledge. Um, but the book of Genesis is so much more than that. It's, it's really a book of wisdom. It's a book kind of teaching us how to use our hearts rather than to be on kind of a head trip. And so I think this is important for us to kind of really see what's the point of this story? Is the point of this story to give us every detail about um, the scientific nature of our planet? Or is the point of this book to really focus us on our human nature? Um, which is not something that can be kind of easily explained. And if, you know, we think of a human being, you know, just in terms of physical traits or physical qualities, you know, if I were to tell you my weight and my height and my eye color, well, what would you really know if I told you that, you know? Whereas if we start looking at our nature, we learn so much more about a person. So I think Genesis 1 is purposefully moving us away from science. Um, science has its place and science is a great thing, um, but it's moving us towards wisdom. It's moving us towards, you know, ultimately what we do here at the Franciscan School of Theology, and that is theology. So the other thing that we have to be, I think, very conscious of, and, and this is a bit of a challenge, is um, that when these books were written, especially when the book of Genesis was written, oftentimes, you know, we'll hear ancient Israelite religion referred to, you know, as a monotheistic religion. And I don't think that's altogether accurate. I think the better word is monolatry, a word probably you haven't come up against very frequently, which is really the worship of one God. And this is what Israel's challenge to do. Because even if you look at something like the Ten Commandments, you know, you'll hear, you shall have no other God but the God of Israel. Well, that implies that this was a challenge, that people did have other gods, that people were tempted to worship other gods. So we're taking all the names of the other gods out of here, and we're trying to focus on the worship of one God. And Israel will move more and more in that direction. But it's a slow movement. Um, you know, with Christ, we see it um, coming closer and closer, but it's a challenge. And even today, you know, we don't have temples here in the United States to many other gods, but perhaps we see um, buildings and structures and that are the center of other people's lives, you know, be that technology, be that sports, 
be that money. Um, those are all, I think, latter day gods that um, we ignore at our peril. So that moves us then to day five. And so with day five, we see you know, the creation of you know, the fish and the fowl. And so this is kind of the creatures in the waters and then the creatures that can kind of fly over the land. Um, so we have that kind of structure. And, um, and then ultimately we'll move to day six where we'll see humans and other land animals that are created. Kind of. And this then marks a change in how we um, see language being used. Because for most of the first 20 verses or 19 verses, we've had this kind of sense of God making things. But then that all important word that was in the first verse, bara, which means to create, that comes again, you know, towards the end of the chapter. And so we start seeing this kind of formula, this new formula, you know, on day five and six, God speaks, then creates, and finally God blesses. And so, so this is, these are important words for us because we see creation as something different than simply making something. So there's a certain kind of hierarchy here. Now, I think we've, we are learning and we need to confront more and more the importance of all God's creation and how there needs to be harmony um, with everything on this planet. And at the same time, um, there's a special emphasis on humanity here in the book of Genesis. And, um, and that's going to be a little bit of a challenge because we don't want to be completely anthropocentric. And at the same time, many of our greatest challenges I think are in how we treat each other. And that's what people probably pay the most attention to. And so we see that I think challenge recognized here and God kind of moving, changing language or the writer changing the language about God as we move into these final verses. So in day six, then we will see that God speaks and makes the wild animals. So that is important for us to kind of have that sense of make. But then when it comes to humanity, God speaks creates and then blesses humanity. So that word bless is, a, is an important word for us. And it's a, in some ways, it's a hard word to completely understand. We use it, I think, quite a bit. And generally, you know, we'll ask for blessings or we ask for God to bless us. But we also have to be willing to bless God. And so it's a bit of a strange um, analogy, and sometimes it's an analogy that kind of bothers a few people, but perhaps the best analogy is with the military, where, you know, if a junior officer or a non-officer you know, salutes someone, and they have to be saluted back. And there's that general, I think, sense in Genesis that the same thing is meant to happen, that, you know, we bless God, and God blesses us. There's a reciprocity going on and an acknowledgement. And so, so blessing really has a lot of that sense. It's something that we do for God, but it's something that God does for us, and then we can do it for each other. But it really points to something very important here. And then this language of creation becomes very intense in day six. And so what happens in day six is that things kind of slow down a little bit. I think they get to kind of a, um, a kind of almost a contemplative um, pace and that we'll see the language goes from very straightforward prose um, in 
the first, I would say, 25 verses to moving more in the direction of poetry. It might not be quite poetry, but if it isn't poetry, I think most would agree that it's very elevated rhetoric and it kind of slows down to make a very important point. Um, so we see at that point ultimately is that, you know, we as humans are made in the image and likeness of God. And so this I think is, is the great profound truth um, that we have to keep on coming back to again and again, that we're made in the image and likeness of God. Now, this is in some ways a very kind of strange, um, you know, I think verse. And we, you know, I put up here kind of some images, but you know, what is the image and likeness of God actually? This is this is very hard. You know, so we can think of God, and I think we're trained and maybe naturally we think of God in terms of images, but perhaps you know, the better understanding or idea is of love, you know, that we're made in the image and likeness of love. And that can be many different things in different people's imagination. But this is, I think, such an important verse for us, you know, especially as Franciscan, Franciscans to be thinking about, you know, that there is a great equality, I think, in this, that all of us are made in this image and likeness. And this verse will also really focus on that both man and woman, or I think it'll kind of say male and female are made in the image and likeness of God. There isn't a sense that one's made for the other. And there isn't that sense that we have in chapter two that technically we refer to the male as ha-adam. Sometimes that can be the earthling. Um, but that first person certainly, you know, has some priority over the second person, which is a, which is a female. None of that is here in the first chapter of the Bible. And I think that's for a very important reason. And um, the editors saw, you know, what the ideal was and put that ideal at the beginning of the Bible for us to keep on returning to. So ultimately, I think there's this great challenge of mutuality in the first chapter of Genesis, that we have to see that equality, that mutuality, that we're made to be working male and female together. If, we're, if we reach back to the beginning of the chapter, we'll be meant to overcome some of the chaos and disorder of this world. And so now if we kind of go back to that theme of orderliness, you can see in this little slide just how much order there is. You know, so day one, you've got day and night. Day four, the greater light and the lesser light. You know, day two, the waters in heaven. Then you've got the fish for the waters in day five and the birds for the heavens in day five. And then day three, we've got the earth and the plants. And then We've got the animals and ultimately male and female that are made. Um, and for Genesis 1, we're all vegetarians. And so, um, so we really are not given permission to eat meat until I would say really the time of Noah. And so there's that kind of essence here and there's that ideal and perhaps that challenge that, you know, in the light, in the light of our um, climate change and light of what Pope Francis is teaching us to to see, we have to think a little bit more about. Um, so we see then, you know, a real clear pattern and order here. And, and then, you know, I'm sure you all have a sense of this, but not only are, does God see goodness when humans are made, but this is the only area where it's described as very good. So so we always have to just see that sense of things being very good when we're looking at our brothers and sisters. And then things end in this, and, and we kind of go right into the beginning of chapter two, although we have the seven kind of seven things that are good in chapter one, that seven uses of that word. And then chapter two is, is all about rest. And, um, and so God blesses 
this whole day and sets aside this day for rest. And, um, and so this, I think, is a great lesson for us, you know, that, um, that while we're called to kind of overcome chaos, um, while we're called to, you know, be compassionate people, um, that there's, we're also called to rest, that there needs to be um, some separation. And ultimate, in the word in um, Hebrew for holiness, Kadesh, kind of has, that means separation. So you kind of separate things out for holiness. And so we separate this day out to be something different from the rest of the days. And, you know, most would say that this is one of the great unique contributions of, of ancient Israelite religion to have this kind of seven day week, and this great emphasis on rest and everyone, including God resting. So once again, we have a model, we have a pattern to follow. We have this great structure um, that we're called to kind of look at. Um, and so finally then, um, the writer of this chapter was generally considered to be the priestly writer. Um, there's lots of different ways to understand how the book of Genesis was written. Um, I like to do it in a very simple way, you know, that there's a priestly writer and a non-priestly writer. Um, there's also the, De there's also the De De Deuteronomy hypothesis, which would have, you know, four different traditions. I prefer just two. And this first tradition is this kind of priestly emphasis on structure, on separating things out, on giving everything its proper place. So if we go back, you know, to that metaphor of the mass, we'll see the importance of structure there and how that allows us to kind of know what's going on. Even if we don't know the language, um, we can see when people are standing, when people are sitting, we kind of know where we are. And so this desire for structure, this desire to overcome chaos, this desire to give us order, um, I think is kind of the hallmark of Genesis. And I think this is all done so that we can just keep on remembering God's goodness, how things started good, how I think we're challenged to keep on finding that goodness, even in difficult situations, even maybe especially where people are suffering. And then to have that all important hope that as God began things, God will also end things and we'll move more and more into God's goodness at the end. So I'll finish up there and I think I went over a few minutes over, but um, give you time for questions and comments. Well, thank you, Father Garrett, uh, for your lecture. A uh, lot, of, lot of things to uh, ponder and to uh, chew upon uh, from what you shared with us today. Uh, this opportunity is brought to you by Franciscan School of Theology Department, our development department. Uh, so let us uh, first of all give Father Garrett a collective applause.